the lecture. Yeah, all good. Yeah, so uh, we'll be covering um, data privacy and pri privacy preserving techniques today. Um, so what's data privacy in your opinion? Please uh, share your uh, opinion about overall, you can like uh, say anything. What is like data privacy in your opinion? Okay, you're using chat. <clears throat> so that my usage of service doesn't leave a giant paper trail. Hmm. That your data isn't being read by an unauthorized personal. Yeah, yeah. So basically it's related to personal information. And uh, so it's information privacy, which refers to like uh, specifically, it refers to your uh, some personal information, and uh, it's it's more like concerned about uh, handling of that personal data uh, and consents, notice, and some regulatory obligations. Uh, and um, most um, in most cases, you will uh, be concerning about whether or how data is shared with third parties, uh, as uh, Benjamin mentioned, like whether some uh, unauthorized personal uh, or some third party has access to the data, to your data or not, and how data is legally collected and stored, storage, um, and, and also currently we have uh, many regulatory restrictions such as GDPR. Um, so what does GDPR say about personal data? So uh, in GDPR itself, it says like personal data means any information related to an identified or identifiable natural person, data subject, uh, and uh, an identifiable natural, natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly in particularly by reference to an identifier such as a name, an identification number, location data, uh, or an online identifier, or to one or more uh, factors specific to the physical, uh, physiological, genetic, mental, economic, cultural, or so, so, social identity of that <coughs> natural person. <clears throat> so here, um, yeah, you can ask. Um. You mentioned here in the GDPR that there's a lot of it and, uh, specifications regarding direct uh, personal identifiable data. But yeah. a lot of the time, if you are online enough, you will create a fingerprint that is just based on metadata, uh, et cetera, which is an identifier in itself, but it that is not mentioned here. Yeah, uh, GDPR itself isn't uh, like, uh, it doesn't cover everything, that's true. Uh, and uh, in current ecosystem, I agree, like you will leave some traces and there are some, uh, some things that isn't covered by uh, regulatory, uh, uh, like regulations, that's true. Yeah, uh, yeah. As I do believe some people claim that if you, for example, use Google enough, etc., you will be able to provide them with enough uh, unique identifiers through metadata, etc., that you could actually be identified even though you yeah. never give out your name or phone number. It's just yeah, like that's true. when you access it, when where you access it is from, what you Google, et cetera. Yeah, that's a uh, that's good point of view that we'll cover it now. Uh, I have a specific question for you about regarding that. Ah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but here, like uh, in GDPR, I just want to take note, like some things, like uh, some interesting things here. Like, uh, for example, it says like, natural uh, person here in the uh, definition, he should be alive, uh, which is uh, like, um, so in legal terms, uh, 
GDPR no longer applies to identifiable data that uh, relate to a person uh, once uh, once they have died, for example. Yeah, which is like, uh, mm, and second thing is like data that is uh, rendered anonymous isn't personal. Uh, so, uh, but, so if uh, the data in the database is anonymous, uh, this rule doesn't apply. But uh, it's uh, hard to say, as you as you mentioned, like uh, hard to prove that the, the data is anonymous. But but we'll cover the techniques for that. So yeah, as I uh, as I mentioned, there are two attitudes on modern privacy. Uh, some people think like that uh, there is so much out there and privacy is lost forever. Like um, we use internet every day and we. Uh, we leave some uh, trace, yeah, and it's like it's really hard to preserve the privacy of people. And second, people, uh, uh, second approach or second attitude is uh, still we need to uh, uh, we need to privacy is very important and we need to keep it. Uh, we need to provide the privacy uh, in any case. Uh, so, what do you think? Yeah, uh, as expected, like uh, as you are studying in computer science and so on, like uh, and mainly youth, uh, they they like uh, people are concerned about their privacy and um, they they have some awareness about it. But in generally public, like uh, lots of people in, in uh, don't don't think about it much, you know. When they use these third parties uh, like Google or Facebook, uh, many people don't uh, don't think about the privacy and how their personal data is used. So Anastasia shares uh, her opinion about like I think it's impossible to keep absolute privacy on the net. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In a sense, uh, currently, as I mentioned, even uh, these regulatory <laughs> frameworks uh, don't cover everything, and it's really hard to really hard to cover every, every point. Uh, and also, there are some new technologies evolving, uh, and uh, these regulatory frameworks are lagging behind. That's true. So we have a uh, yeah. So uh, uh, interestingly, uh, in the group class, uh, the opinions uh, were divided as as expected. Uh, some people think like it's uh, really hard to keep absolute privacy. Some people think it's still possible if you if you use uh, with caution and uh, you don't use some certain services. So we are seeing some uh, headlines from news, like uh, we have, you have probably seen like Equifax, uh, massive data breach, uh, also like um, Cambridge Analytica with Facebook and so on. Like we were seeing such articles uh, every year. Uh, for example, the Twitter hack in, in this summer, uh, in the last summer, uh, so uh, this kind of data breaches are happening uh, almost every every year, like big ones. Uh, also, we are seeing the second headlines uh, like this. So it's like 
Um, so these articles mention like uh, there are, the, the anonymous data was can can be used to identify you. So, uh, for example, some uh, company says that we are putting uh, into net some anonymous data sets, but still uh, um, there are ways to uh, to get some some personal information from data from these data sets. Uh, so you can be anonymized, but you can't hide. So so uh, so these kind of articles. Uh, uh, and the research articles uh, say that uh, claim that uh, it's uh, with current anon anonymization techniques, it's still hard to provide uh, real anonymity. Uh, so this, uh, <clears throat> so we saw two types of headlines. First was like theft loss, uh, uh, so failure of some access control, some security. Uh, like was that centralized databases were hacked and so on. This is a, this is the first um, type. Second time type was like uh, inference enabled by uh, anonymized an anonymized information. So you can infer some uh, personal information even from uh, anonymous data sets uh, in in current um, in current conditions. Like uh, so, questions. How we can avoid such failures? Is anonymization sufficient for privacy? <clears throat> Which are like not an easy questions to answer. Um, but in my opinion, um, also current techniques doesn't work. They need, uh, we can keep researching, keep uh, improving these techniques like anonymization techniques to get a more uh, efficient ones, which really provides you some privacy. But we'll cover the, the current state of the art for, for now. Uh, this is more like general question. Why, why care? Uh, reasons for protecting personal data. Uh, and some of you already answered it uh, with your, uh, yeah. Uh, put your ideas in the chat. Uh, so damages da damages include like uh, identity theft, uh, theft. so you can lose uh, your identity, fraud, uh, blackmail, so like general discrimination, yeah, uh, some racial, racial discrimination or some, lots of things, yeah, basically. So it has a big uh, damage if you, uh, if you, if you don't protect your personal data in that, Mm. Yeah, I, I'm also a bit, a bit concerning. Like, for example, I use uh, many <laughs> uh, websites, for example, and every time they ask me to sign in, uh, and uh, I really feel bad. Like, every time I give some information about myself to like some some small websites, for example, and some big ones like uh, by big big tech uh, technology uh, companies, but still uh, like, yeah, Benjamin, or uh, you raise your hand. Ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah. Um, that's a, that's a big uh, problem uh, problem and uh, no, it isn't moving. Oh, sorry, I, my my computer is a bit lagging. Uh, yeah, and also we have uh, like uh, as the technology evolves. Uh, we have, uh, it, it's adding more uh, challenges to us to protect the personal information. For example, uh, there are lots of personal devices now, like phones, fitness trackers, uh, some implants, uh, smart devices, uh, like lots of surveillance cameras used in, in the world. Uh, IoT devices are coming, web tracking. So 
all of these uh, devices, let's say, uh, gazer data, some sort of, and uh, it, uh, if not used correctly, it, it will bring challenges. Uh, yeah, like outsourcing of data management is common now, and also uh, location data tracking and increasing health record. So uh, we, uh, we have all information about us, like in a digital form, almost like. Yeah, in some places they can be hunted down by the government if, uh, if their personal info is leaked. Yes, that's true. I, and I, I think like, uh, we can say like in not in some place but in majority of governments it's like that yeah like lots of examples so um but but uh, personal data has value so uh, for example in healthcare uh, uh, it could be used for 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 good and uh, and also for real time public resource allocation in some uh, some emergency situations. Uh, maybe, uh, for example, to track some disease like COVID, if it's used properly, so it, it has some good examples uh, in use case also. But, uh, but it's mainly currently used for private good examples like uh, product tar targeting and like advertising, uh, for example, uh, as yeah, Benjamin mentioned, like Facebook, for example, collects uh, uses our data and uh, sells it uh, so for advertising. And uh, so basically, we don't own that data. Uh, also, uh, Which is a kind of um, bro broken system because uh, uh, in a in a in a in an ideal case you need to give a consent to every use use of your data and you should be in control of your personal data and actually the self sovereign identity concept is about that. And we will have a lecture about self sovereign uh, identity in i think in early march yeah so we will cover it in more detail so uh, there, there are emerging new uh, concepts uh, i uh, like self sovereign identity which uh, uh, which is trying to solve these problems in a sense uh, but for now we will cover some uh, traditional uh, privacy preserving techniques uh, uh, and we will give a high level summary of current state of the art for privacy preserving techniques. And we'll focus on concepts and basic ideas. Uh, so the, ma the main uh, techniques are like transformation techniques uh, are, uh, one second, data perturbation, uh, which is a popular technique for privacy preserving uh, data mining. Uh, so it basically uh, uses some probability probability distribution approach. So you uh, you replace the data with another sample, for example, or uh, or value distortion approach, which basically means uh, you perturb uh, uh, data elements in the data set, uh, for example, by adding some noise. And the second one is data anonymization. Uh, Data anonymization is uh, more like is a process of uh, protecting sensitive information uh, by uh, by erasing or encrypting. Uh, so in in this case, you can uh, remove the data even in from data set to to provide uh, anonymization. So we'll cover uh, some of them like key anonymization, L diversity, and key closeness now. Uh, so uh, yeah, in summary, data perturbation is more like uh, modifying, slightly modifying the data by adding uh, some noise. Uh, but data anonymization is like um, uh, 
uh, generalizing or like a bit uh, erasing some data uh, to make it anonymous. So yeah, we'll, you'll see it now. Um, so yeah, K anonymity, for example. Um, the, the fundamental idea in this approach is that uh, sufficiently common uh, shared trait isn't identifying. So, uh, <clears throat> so attributes uh, are suppressed or generalized until each, uh, like you have a group of K which have same uh, attributes. Um, so unlike perturbation models, key anonymity guarantees that the data released is accurate. So it, it's accurate because you don't use, uh, you don't add some noise or you don't uh, change the, uh, uh, like you don't use some randomization here, techniques here, but, but uh, you can generalize or you can, uh, you can erase some, some data to make it, uh, to make, uh, to divide the data set to similar groups, let's say, yeah. So uh, for example, uh, for example here, so it's two anonymity. So K is two here. So it, it means that uh, at least two, uh, two attributes are, uh, will be the same in over, overall in the data set. Uh, for, example, for example, you know that the person is white and uh, his race is, uh, or her race is, or, uh, is uh, white, he's white, but, uh, but from the table you have, you don't know which of this uh, T5, T6, T7, is, uh, is a person that you are looking for. So it, it hides it in, in such manner. Um, uh, yeah, one thing to mention. <clears throat> this, uh, uh, this K anonymity techniques apply to only quasi identifiers. Uh, quasi identifiers uh, are uh, pieces of information uh, that aren't themselves unique identifiers. So it, a unique identifier is like uh, is a personal identifier information like a national ID, your name, uh, yeah, like which gives you, um, so which identifies you from immediately. So, uh, but a key anonymity is applied to only some attributes like quasi identifiers. Uh, um, yeah, like you, you can say like some, to some, some sensitive attributes only. And uh, so K anonymity is easy to understand. Uh, it uh, seems to be uh, seems to be plausible uh, protection, and it could be yeah, but uh, but it has some weaknesses. Uh, well, now first, I need to cover uh, how how you can do it. So uh, as I mentioned, there are two techniques. One is suppression. So you can repl replace, for example, individual attributes with uh, asterisk. So you hide it. And in that way, uh, uh, you you uh, protect the sensitive data. Uh, the second uh, technique here in is is generalization. So let's say uh, you have Asian, black, and white, but uh, single ones, and you cannot use them because uh, you cannot group them uh, to make uh, to make it anonymous. So you just generalize it. To, as a person, which basically means you you lose uh, you you lose uh, information you uh, you lose um, utility. So utility decreases as k increases here. So uh, as as you increase k, you 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 you, you lose uh, utility, and the data set uh, will be like useless in a sense. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, the weakness is there are some attacks on this uh, uh, on this method. For example, uh, uh, first I need to mention the background knowledge attack. So it uh, if you have some other uh, like background knowledge about uh, the person, <clears throat> you can use that to uh, identify uh, the person or the narrow down uh, the information you have. 
so you you basically use your uh, knowledge to reduce uh, the set of possible values for the for for the sensitive attribute, and the second attack is a homogeneity attack. This attack uh, leverages the case where all the values for a sensitive value uh, within a set of k records are are identical. So uh, I will give an example. For example, let's say uh, in the right corner you see the table. Uh, for example, uh, you, uh, Smith, you know that uh, the, uh, you are looking for Smith, and but in the table, uh, both of like uh, both of them has cancer. You know, like sensitive sensitive attributes are identical. So uh, also, you don't know which person is he, uh, which person you are looking for, but you know that uh, both of them are, has a cancer. So, so because of that, uh, there is uh, the uh, modification of uh, K anonymity is L diversity. So L diversity method uh, was created to further uh, K anonymity by additionally maintaining the diversity of sensitive fields. So they just, for example, in the right uh, table, they just removed <laughs> the data uh, to make it more uh, to, to to make it uh, more diverse. Uh, uh, and also, uh, even even for L diverse data data, uh, uh, some uh, some attacks were found. Like, the, uh, for example, given the existence of data uh, data breaches, uh, like there was like some some um, some people could infer <coughs> based upon the distribution of values. So they use some distribution. <coughs> values uh, for L diverse data. And uh, T closeness is another modification of this technique, which uh, extends the model uh, L diversity by treating the values of uh, attribute distinctly by taking into, into account the distribution of, of values. So, <coughs> so as you go further and further, uh, the data, data set will become more, uh, it, it will lose its utility, but it will become more and more uh, Mm, privacy preserving, yeah, anonymous, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but as you see, there, there is like a uh, quite uh, weakness in these techniques because uh, they, uh, mm, if the, the data, uh, if the K, for example, is increases, uh, you will lose utility. If you use T closeness, uh, you lose also like uh, uh, utility of the data. So th there is a new approach, uh, which is the algorithm algorithmic approach. Uh, it's called differential privacy. Uh, for example, in uh, in this, um, you mainly uh, when you access the data, you use queries, uh, and in queries you uh, you get some results uh, based on your queries. And this approach uh, applies some algorithm uh, to, to every query and gives you an uh, anonymous uh, answer. Right? Um, yeah, so basically we apply some randomized algorithm uh, to, to query responses. Uh, and what kind of algorithm? It's a noise-based algorithm. So it, it, this technique is uh, not, uh, it's a perturbation technique as uh, what I covered before. So what kind of algorithm? So this algorithm, uh, this theory, theory definition was proposed by G work in 2006. Uh, and th th there, is a, there is a randomized algorithm M uh, such as for all neighboring databases, uh, D and D, uh, D, D approximate, and all sets of possible outputs, we have this uh, equation. Uh, it could be confusing here, but I will try to explain it more in uh, a more uh, easy example. So here, uh, alpha is, uh, is a privacy loss. M is a randomized algorithm. And two Ds are like uh, two neighboring uh, databases. So two, two a bit different databases. And when you, uh, when you access these two databases, you should have almost similar uh, result, even though they, they differ a bit. So, uh, and 
this is measured by alpha. So, uh, and we call it uh, alpha differentially private. So as, uh, so decreasing in alpha leads to a decrease in accuracy, but you will have more privacy. So here also, uh, um, uh, you need to keep a balance between privacy and utility, but you can measure it. One good thing is that you can uh, measure it uh, with this uh, algorithm, uh, with this uh, differential privacy technique. Uh, so this is an example. For example, you have one uh, database uh, uh, and the second database, which is uh, you remove X. X is some element, for example, you remove it. Uh, or some pe person's name or some person's personal information, you remove it from the second database. So only difference is uh, one entry. And you analyze and compute, you get output. And the different is, uh, difference is at most alpha. So uh, <clears throat> alpha is a metric of privacy loss <clears throat> at a differential with changing data, adding, remo removing one entry. <clears throat> <clears throat> the, small, uh, <clears throat> the smaller the value is, the better privacy protection. But the smaller is the, the value is, the, <clears throat> the, uh, the utility decreases. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> second. So some properties of uh, differential privacy. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, this is a, a new technique and it's still ongoing research on this, on this one. But it has some quite uh, useful uh, and unique properties, which, uh, which, uh, which for, uh, traditional ones didn't have. <clears throat> so uh, it holds for any property on individuals, including identity. So you can query and you can get an uh, anonymized <clears throat> answer. For, uh, for identity data, like personal identifiable information also, not only attributes or also uh, identity information. It's insensitive, insensitive to post-processing. So you will get the query result and you can also, uh, you can uh, apply some post-processing techniques to, to identify, uh, uh, to, to de-anonymize the data, but it doesn't work here. So it's insensitive and it was proven by uh, by researchers, uh, you can, but you need to read some papers uh, with a lot of uh, mathematical uh, proofs to uh, to see it. Uh, yeah, to verify it yourself. <laughs> and uh, uh, the guarantee holds regardless of what adversary knows. So basically, uh, here the background knowledge attack cannot isn't possible because it doesn't matter. And uh, the last one is it composes additively, uh, which is very useful uh, uh, for uh, real world use cases. For example, if M1 uh, algorithm achieves uh, epsilon one, epsilon is here as the alpha by privacy loss. And the M2 achieves uh, epsilon two, uh, DP uh, respectively, then uh, M achieves, like you can just add it. So it's add additive as the name says, so it's very good. Uh, but there are some problems. Um, there are some query functions for which no known algorithm exists such that we can provide both differential privacy and utility. So uh, you, you, you ask qu uh, queries and, but some, for some queries, uh, the algorithm cannot reply with, uh, we, like it will kind of, without utility, so it's, it, it changes it more, uh, very a lot and you, you don't have utility from your the response. And uh, meeting expectations of anonymized data sharing is difficult. Uh, yeah, it's more like I think uh, related to the fact that it's really hard to, uh, to guarantee anonymization uh, because uh, it's hard to guarantee, it's hard to prove it, and uh, also uh, it's hard to use it for, for a sense, yeah. Uh, so some practical applications, uh, it's in early stage, so there are some applications, for example, Google's uh, wrapper project, 
which is used to report usage statistics for Google Chrome. So you can read about it from the link. They, uh, they applied this, uh, this differential privacy technique to the data set uh, and, uh, and make it, made it public, I think, yeah. And the second is uh, Microsoft's Pin project. So there are some use cases now. But this uh, technique is at early stage and uh, still uh, ongoing research and development. Mm, well, the next technique, next approach is cryptographic approaches. Uh, but I think we can have a break right here. Um, how long do you want? Five or 10 minutes? Ten is good. Okay, so let's meet at uh, uh, 10 past two, okay? Uh, Marish, are, are you here? You can you can start restart. Yep, I restarted. Okay, nice. So we'll continue with uh, in the second part. We'll continue with cryptographic approaches, uh, which uh, basically some techniques uh, which which allow you to preserve the privacy. The first one is uh, secure multi-party computation. <clears throat> so uh, it was. Uh, so MPC, short as SMPC, or is uh, was pr uh, proposed by Yao in 1982. Uh, he applied this two-party computation uh, protocol um, in order to solve this uh, millionaire problem. So, for example, um, two or more uh, millionaires uh, would like to learn who among them is the richest, without revealing to the others uh, the money they own. So, so they want to compete something without revealing their uh, their inputs, uh, and it was <coughs> it was the first use case or uh, like in nineteen eighty two, and it evolved since then, and it it was made more efficient, uh, more uh, more fa quick computations currently possible. Uh, we will we'll, we'll, we'll cover it a bit. And second is homomorphic encryption, uh, which is uh, which allows computation on encrypted data. So let's say you have you have a data set and uh, you it's encrypted, and uh, you have a second data set which is also encrypted. So uh, encrypted means like it's uh, it's kind of anonymous, but uh, you can uh, you can you can uh, make some computation uh, to um, encrypted data sets. But this, uh, uh, this approach has some limitations, for example, uh, only some basic, for basic operations are possible, like add addition, multiplication, uh, and so on. But still it has uh, quite, good use cases and uh, the space is evolving and many uh, projects and companies using this technique. And the last one uh, is zero knowledge proofs. Uh, so here uh, the prover uh, can prove to another party uh, to verify that they know value X without conveying any information apart from the fact that they know the value X, yeah. Uh, and for zero knowledge proofs, uh, it has, I think, many applications. Mostly, uh, I will be covering some uh, in blockchains, maybe in, not in this lecture, yeah. but still. So, for zero knowledge proofs, I have one uh, video if I can share it. Uh, 
Uh, sorry. One second. Yeah. So this link doesn't work. Okay, we'll go to the next one. I, I wanted to show some video, short video about zero knowledge proofs. Yeah. Then we'll just go through the secure multi-party computation uh, a bit deeper. So basically, this uh, framework uh, uh, describes the computation between parties who don't trust each other. So when, when uh, in a case when parties don't trust each other, uh, they can use uh, SMPC to uh, calculate, to make a computation on some function uh, without revealing information about the inputs. Uh, and they will get the result only. And it has some requirements. Uh, so the computation uh, must preserve certain security properties. Uh, the first one is uh, correctness. So parties uh, obtain a correct output. Uh, so even so if some parties misbehave, uh, uh, the computation result should be correct. Uh, second is privacy. So the only the output is learned, nothing else, no, no inputs are learned. Independence of inputs. Parties cannot cho choose their inputs as a function of other parties' inputs. Fairness. If one party learns the output, then all parties learn the output, which is fair. <laughs> and the last one is guaranteed output delivery. Uh, so all honest parties learn the output. So if these uh, security requirements are satisfied, uh, it means that the protocol is working. And uh, as you can see, uh, or I will cover it in, yeah, okay. Uh, so there are some examples. Uh, for example, it could be used, so it, it, it could have many uh, use cases. One is elections, for example. We have N parties, each one has a yes or no vote. And the goal is to determine whether the majority voted yes, but no voter should learn how the other people voted. Or it, uh, uh, the second example is auction. So each bidder makes an offer and uh, the goal is to de 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 determine uh, whose offer won without revealing losing offers. And the last one is, I will give some uh, real world examples for distributed data mining. Uh, which is very popular uh, currently. Uh, so for example, two companies want to compare their data sets without revealing them. Uh, for example, hospitals, which can't share uh, their patient record, records due to that privacy concerns with anyone, but want to data mine on combined data. Uh, so if you, uh, yeah, so in this uh, use case, uh, some <clears throat> some projects are applying uh, secure multi-party computation. And a couple of observations. <clears throat> In all cases, we are dealing with distributed multi-party party protocols. So uh, here, uh, here's the thing is the, the, how to say, strongest use case of multi-party computation is that it's a distributed protocol, so uh, we don't have uh, a trusted third party with central database, central computation uh, resources who can compute uh, it. So it's most likely uh, the goal of uh, secure multi-party computation is to achieve the same result without involving trusted third party, which is uh, yeah, which is which is quite used in. Uh, in blockchain systems, yeah. Uh, some uh, real-world applications, as I mentioned, are like uh, YANA system, 
or as, uh, and also Cybernetica is it's Estonian based company called uh, ShareMind. They they developed Cybernetica. So it provides NPC secure database. So they are kind of providing private data as a service system, their business model. And uh, so, so encryption happens uh, during processing here, uh, not uh, as opposed to data storage. And instead of uh, having centralized uh, encrypted database, they use a distributed secret shared database. So uh, data hosts are also distributed and they, they perform computation. Uh, yeah, here are the further uh, reading materials uh, for uh, secure uh, multi-party computation. Uh, you can go through these articles uh, if you want to go further. And uh, next, I would I wanted to discuss uh, like privacy preservation for blockchain, but you. You 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 will get you you have introduction to blockchain in the next week I think but um, yeah I think I will cover it in in the next lecture uh, so in blockchain systems like uh, there are three main uh, three main uh, categories which we identified first one was to ident uh, to anonymize the identity data second was transaction data as uh, blockchain networks are mostly concerned about transactions and third one was about privacy pre privacy preservation of smart contracts and in this uh, in this example they used uh, secure multi party computation some of the uh, some of the researchers and projects used it and uh, the and um, zero knowledge proofs and also differential privacy, homomorphic encryption. Uh, these techniques were applied. Uh, I I can show it uh, with some uh, more details. I think in the next uh, next lecture where I will cover uh, anonymous communication protocols and also some techniques in blockchain. Also, I can cover it. In more detail. So this uh, lecture was more general uh, about the concepts, but in the next we'll cover the protocols uh, a bit and uh, yeah, in more detail. Let's say yeah. Um, and the, the privacy uh, in, in communication protocols will cover uh, Tor and the Whisper. Uh, it's a, it's a distributed. Uh, privacy preserving uh, communication tools. Uh, and for the next lecture, uh, we will cover properties, use cases, uh, and some requirements for, this, for such systems. And I would like to give some uh, reading homework for you, uh, but I think not, not next week. So I think I will update uh, in the wiki. So it, uh, And you will see it in the wiki, I think. But uh, in the next next lecture is about blockchain overall. So not uh, not to the next week. The task is to like in in couple of weeks, I think. Uh, but uh, please check uh, wiki uh, regularly so you can see what to do, and uh, so we can uh, have a lecture in a more like discussion part format. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's the references. I will upload the slides. Uh, so my presentation today is over, which was very quick. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, if anyone has any questions. Uh, yeah, thank you for you uh, for joining this lecture, and hope to see you uh, in not not next week, uh, two two maybe three weeks after we will have a lecture about self-serving identities, 
and after that, I think we'll have a, uh, a lecture about these communication protocols uh, specifically. Uh, and I will upload these uh, le uh, lecture slides to Wiki. And uh, yeah, so you will have all uh, necessary references and materials if you want to go, uh, go deeper and uh, uh, search on it. Yeah. I think uh, we can stop uh, recording here.